On Five News, the winner isn't La La Land. There's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. In an embarrassing mix-up, millions of viewers see the Oscar given to the wrong film. It was an astonishing moment. In the end, Moonlight was handed the night's biggest prize. Even in my dreams, this could not be true. But to hell with dreams. I'm done with it, because this is true. Oh, my goodness. Also, a Five News exclusive, the murderer Ian Brady hints that a gun found on Saddleworth Moor might have been his. Could it help in the hunt for his victim's burial site? The yeah. missed chance to save a little girl's life. Her family want answers about the GP who sent her away. Well, it's going to be a serious case for her to be punished. What does she have to do? Like, what? how many more lives she's got to ruin? And after all the controversy, diversity is the real winner at the Academy Awards. Hello and welcome to Five News. I'm Sean Williams. It is a plot twist of Hollywood proportions and the most embarrassing gaffe to hit the Academy Awards in its 89-year history. The award for best film, the highlight of the night, went to La La Land. Except it didn't. Just as the producers were making acceptance speeches, there was a flurry of on-stage panic as it was revealed the Oscar should have gone to Moonlight instead, a low-budget movie with an all-black cast. An inquiry is taking place, but as Dominic Reynolds reports, the monumental blunder is overshadowing a momentous achievement. You can see the moment Warren Beatty realises he's holding an Oscar fiasco in his hands. And the Academy Award. He hesitates. He checks again. For best picture. And then lets his Bonnie and Clyde co-star Faye Dunaway do the deed. La La Land. Now that was the Oscar night ending the makers of musical La La Land had been hoping for. But it wasn't really the end. And the Hollywood and the hearts and minds of people everywhere. Behind the speeches, men in headsets are examining envelopes. And then the twist is revealed. This, there's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. Moonlight won. Amid total confusion on stage, the man who's just thanked his mum hands over his Oscar. Moonlight, Best Picture. Wait, wait, Moonlight's won Best Picture. It was a tough moment for the backstage Oscar pundits. Moonlight won Best Picture. Whoa, we have a little... Oh, my goodness. Warren Beatty apparently read the wrong name. This is incredible. Moonlight. Cue celebration from the correct Best Picture winners, Moonlight. Very clearly, even in my dreams, this could not be true. <laughs> but to hell with dreams. I'm done with it, because this is true. Oh, my goodness. Now, Warren had tried to explain. I opened the envelope. And it said, Emma Stone, La La Land. It appears the mix-up was down to these two. So we're both excited about this process every year. Accountants from the firm PWC, which counted the votes, they have two copies of all envelopes, and the presenters were sent on stage with a duplicate of the Best Actress winner. Afterwards, the man who nearly won was graceful in defeat. What happened, happened. Uh, it was... Uh, it was unfortunate, but it was a real honor to be able to give those awards to my friends from Moonlight. Mistakes don't really come any bigger, so when the stakes are that high, how can they happen? People saying the wrong thing on stage, you can't, you can't stop. But handing them the wrong envelope, you can plan for that. and You can ensure that that doesn't happen. Behind the spectacular slip-up, this was a big win for non-white Hollywood. Two acting awards and that Best Picture statue were won by African Americans after two years of controversy about diversity. The legacy of this year's ceremony may be Hollywood getting diversity right. It will be remembered for one jaw-dropping mistake. Dominic Reynolds, Five News. Well, it's not the first time that blunders have been broadcast to a worldwide audience. Catch up with some of the others, if you can bear it, on our Facebook page. Search for C5 News. We'll bring you the rest of the Oscars at the end of the show. For more than a half a century, the Moors murderer, Ian Brady, has refused to reveal crucial information about the killing of Keith Bennett. 
His body has never been found, although it's believed to be buried on Saddleworth Moor. That has led to campaigners taking up the search for themselves. Now, Brady has given Five News a cryptic hint about his connection to a gun they discovered in the area. With this exclusive report, here's Julian Drucker. It is a vast area of natural beauty, but Saddleworth Moor remains tainted by the depravity of half a century ago. Three bodies were found in makeshift shallow graves here, but one remains. That of 12-year-old Keith Bennett. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley eventually admitted murdering him, but their method was never clear. And the location of his body is the cruel detail still withheld by Britain's longest serving prisoner. After police officially stopped looking in 2009, campaigners like Erica Gregory took over. Yeah, that's where the initials are carved, upon the corner of there. I joined her on one of her regular visits to the remote area where some suspect Keith Bennett is buried. There, last summer, she unearthed something potentially significant. And we just sat there and went, oh my God, we found a handbag at first. We thought, we, we thought we'd found clothing or a handbag or something, you know, maybe we found, we're going to find more. As soon as we started moving away the polythene, the black polythene that was surrounding it, we noticed it was a shotgun. Snapped with the handle, with the bag, um, a wallet, a licence wallet with the plastic removed, and it was just there next to this tree. It's been so unexpected it to was, find a shotgun. It was a shock. Shortly afterwards, that double barreled shotgun with this distinctive branding was handed on to armed officers and a forensics team. So can that very unusual discovery right here be linked to the Moors murderer, Ian Brady, another of the secrets he has kept for more than 50 years? We wrote to him at Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital. He replied with this one page letter to Five News. Brady references the weapon with this intriguing response. Shotgun, he wrote. I had two shotguns, two revolvers, two rifles, and an automatic, strategically placed. The police only got the revolvers on one rifle. Yeah, they do. Brady's suggestion he carefully hid items on this stretch of the moors could be crucial in making other discoveries. But is he simply playing a game? And what's the weapon even his? Greater Manchester Police told Five News, we examined the gun to see if it could be linked to any criminal incident that has occurred nationally. However, due to the amount of time it had been in the ground, the degradation was so much that there were no forensic opportunities available. But one of the country's top firearms experts says this type of weapon is at least consistent with the era Brady was active and may have been buried in a hurry. Their popularity really blossomed in the 60s. Now, whoever did stash it didn't make a very good job of it. Because I, I've seen guns that have come out of the ground in the 30s that were really well protected and um, there's very little wrong with them. This is thought to be the first time Brady has ever referred to a stash of weapons hidden on the moors. But he has meticulously shared other details before. What he can do is he can keep control of small pieces of information, but for him the game is what's important, this game of controlling the information and keeping some things hidden. It is of course impossible to do a thorough search of an area as large as this, but Keith Bennett's body is here, somewhere. Julian, what have the families of Ian Brady's victims got to say about all this? Well, really hard to determine whether that gun did belong to Ian Brady, but crucially, the discovery shows that there is there are parts of the moors that haven't been searched for decades, if ever. Uh, John Kilbride was another of the victims. Like Keith Bennett, he was 12 when he was murdered by Brady and Hindley. I've spoken to his brother, Terry. He says that that area needs to be looked into. Uh, what's a shotgun doing there, he says. Uh, he says he always thought the police should continue the search. Well, are Greater Manchester Police going to continue that search? Are they going to go back to that area? They said they always would if there was fresh evidence. Uh, we have passed on our information. They are yet to answer that question. Julian, thank you. There are warnings that car insurance bills are going to go up. Changes are being made to the system for compensation payments, but industry experts say it could add £75 a year to the average cover. NHS England is investigating after hundreds of thousands of documents were put in storage. 
rather than being sent to GPs or filed in patients' records. Among them were around 2,500 test results for cancer patients who may have needed further checks. And an elderly man has died days after a tree fell on his car in Shropshire during Storm Doris. The man, who was in his 80s, was a passenger in the car when the tree was brought down by high winds. Two and a half years after it was set up and with its fourth chairperson in charge, the inquiry into child sexual abuse in England and Wales finally began today. For its first investigation, it's hearing about the horrific stories of thousands of British children who were sent to Australia between the 1940s and 70s, many of whom were abused or put into forced labour. Our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, heard their evidence. They were all poor, many were in care and they thought they were going to Australia for a better chance at life. Thousands of British children were sent by local authorities after the war. But while footage from the time shows a happy outdoor experience, the reality was often more like slave labour. 16 hour a day, seven days a week, and you did that a month at a time. David Hill was sent to a farm called Fairbridge. He was starved and beaten. Many others were also sexually abused. The memories of the time still haunt him. There was a lot of physical discipline. Um, it was a harsh place. Uh, it was okay for me because I was 12, nearly 13. But the little kids, as young as four, who spend an entire childhood with uh, no parent, no love, not even a warm arm around them, uh, and they were the ones that were the least protected, the most vulnerable, and it turns out, and this inquiry is going to discover, the most frequently abused. Today, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse opened in London with evidence about the child migrants. Sexual assaults were prevalent. Many of the former child migrants will testify that they suffered in silence. You will hear that they considered that no one would believe them. Others will testify that they told people, but instead of protection, received physical uh, punishment. The impact on victims has been crushing, as David Hill described. Many never recover and are permanently afflicted with guilt, shame, diminished self-confidence, low self-esteem, fear and trauma. Over the next fortnight, the inquiry will hear from 22 victims. Then in July, the focus will turn to the government, local authorities, charities. What did they know? What did they do? How was this widespread abuse allowed to happen? Tessa Chapman, Five News. Coming up on Five News. Pressure grows on the government over its plans to block changes to disability benefits. And it wasn't all bad news for La La Land at the Oscars. Find out what awards the film did win. That's straight after the break. Hello and welcome back. You're watching Five News. The government is under pressure to reverse its plans to cut back the bill for disability payments. And that comes after a comment by one of the Prime Minister's most senior aides caused anger. Defending the plans, George Freeman said money should go to the really disabled, not those taking pills at home, suffering anxiety. Here's our political editor, Andy Bell. James Downs is at Cambridge studying psychology, but he's suffered from anxiety, depression and eating disorders. And he worries soon he may not get all the support he needs. I feel that without that, it would be, you know, potentially I could relapse and the consequences of that in terms of the recovery that I've built are, are really not worth thinking about and it'd be very, very expensive for the NHS to pick up the pieces too. The government has overruled two tribunals with the result that fewer disabled people will be eligible for higher personal independence payments, or PIPs. This will mean about 160,000 people will get less money than they would have done. The government believes it will save about £3.7 billion. When you're running a, a benefit support system that pays large amounts of cash week in, week out to millions of people with disabilities, you do need some pretty clear regulations and rules. You do need to make some definitions about who will receive higher payments and, and, or less payments. Uh, and that's why ministers have got to make these difficult judgments and they're right to do so. 
But the chief policy advisor at number 10 said money should go to the really disabled, not those taking pills at home suffering anxiety. Awkward for Theresa May, who said she wants equality of treatment for mental and physical illness. In this particular area, uh, really the Department for Work and Pensions doesn't really fully understand the issues that face people with mental health problems and unfortunately this is the latest in a long line of uh, benefits related issues that people with mental health problems are coming out second best. Setting who gets pips and how much is controversial. This was last year before the budget and this year the pressure is on the government again to change its mind. Andy Belt, 5 News. A man has been convicted of stealing a million pounds worth of valuables from Simon Cowell's home. The TV star and his family were sleeping at the house in West London in December 2015 when Darren February broke in. The 33-year-old is already in jail after causing death by dangerous driving. The family of a young girl with asthma who died hours after being turned away by her GP say they're angry her doctor won't be struck off. Five-year-old Ellie Mae Clark and her mum were told they were too late for their appointment and that night Ellie died following a seizure. Her grandmother has told Five News that the decision has shattered their lives. Our health correspondent, Catherine Jones, went to meet them. <laughs> Five-year-old Ellie Mae Clark died after a severe asthma attack just over two years ago. She was just a joy to be around, caring, living, thoughtful. She was perfect. Ellie had been due to see this GP, Joanne Rowe, as an emergency patient on the day of her fatal attack. But Ellie was a few minutes late and Dr Rowe refused to see her. She shouldn't have been turned away, no matter child, adult, anyone. That's a job of a doctor to, to care and look after people. So, I'm just disgusted with her. An inquiry found the practice staff thought Dr Rowe unapproachable and volatile, meaning they were afraid to challenge her decisions, fearful of repeated angry outbursts directed at them. When Dr Rowe left the practice, Ellie's family presumed she'd been prevented from working so they were devastated to learn she has been allowed to continue. The General Medical Council, which polices the profession, instead gave her a warning, deciding this failing in itself is not so serious as to require any restriction on your registration. What is going to be a serious case for her to be punished? What does she have to do? Like, what, how many more lives she's got to ruin? We contacted Dr Rowe, but she has not provided a comment. Ellie's grandmother just wants to ensure that the little girl's death prevents anyone else being turned away when they're desperately in need of a doctor's care. Catherine Jones, 5 News. Now, just to let you know, there's more news on our Facebook page today, including this amazing moment. It's from a football match in the Czech Republic. A footballer saved the life of one of his opponents following a sickening collision. You can find that page by searching for C5 News. Back to the Academy Awards now. And aside from the very small matter of handing the biggest prize to the wrong film, there were plenty of talking points from last night's Oscars. For La La Land, there was the consolation of winning the most awards, while the host, Jimmy Kimmel, raised eyebrows with a few choice stunts. Olivia Kinsley was watching. The night began with Justin Timberlake raising the star-studded crowd to its feet. Host for the evening, comedian Jimmy Kimmel took no time at all to take a pop at Donald Trump. I want to say thank you to President Trump. I mean, remember last year when it seemed like the Oscars were racist? <laughs> he later got out his phone and tweeted him, you up? This is the first Oscar in second Before La La Land's Emma mortifying Stone. moment, it won six awards, including for Best Actress for Emma Stone. Such a wonderful experience, and Ryan Gosling, thank you for making me laugh. <laughs> he missed out on Best Actor, which went to Casey which Affleck in Manchester by the Sea. Well, I can't be his guardian. Giving his speech, he seemed lost for words. That means so much to me, thank you. Uh, uh, whew, damn it. London-based director Christoph Dayak won Best Live Action short for his film, Sing. 
it's pretty amazing actually you know just facing hundreds of massive celebrities sitting in those in those rows in front of you and uh, having to deliver a speech that's what I promised Best Supporting Actor went to Moonlight's Mahershala Ali, the first ever Muslim film star to get an Oscar. I got a life too. And Viola Davis triumphed in Fences, winning Best Supporting Actress. They and this busload of tourists will remember far more than the best film fiasco. How's a selfie with Ryan Gosling for a souvenir? Olivia Kinsley, Five News. And if you still can't get enough of the Oscars, Matt's got more of it on Five News tonight. Absolutely right, Sean. Only one real talking point in town today. Yes, the Oscars. We're going to have lots more on the great gaff. Did it overshadow what should have been a momentous night for the cast and crew of Moonlight? There was another gaff as well, Sean, by the way, which we'll reveal later on. And also, after all the controversy surrounding diversity at the Oscars Awards in previous years, did this year actually redress the balance? I'll be joined by film critic Mark Eggleston, Caroline Frost from the Huffington Post, and Akua Gamfi from the British Blacklist to talk about all of that. Hello also, of course, be looking at the Oscars glamour fashion designer Jacques Azagiri will be here with me with his verdict on who stole the show on the red carpet. And that includes tuxedos as well, not just women. Of course women. it does, yeah, not just the women. Thank you very much, Thanks, Matt. Sean. See you a little bit later on. That is it for us, though. Chris Page has the weather for you next. I'll see you again tomorrow at 5. Matt is back at 6.30. Thanks for watching tonight. Bye for now.